Hi, this is John Carpenter, and you're listening to The I. Walter Show. Faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird brain. It's a plane. It's I. Walter. I. Walter. Yes, it's I, Walter, strange visitor from another planet who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. I, Walter, who can change the course of mighty rivers, bend ears with his annoying voice, and who disguised as Walter Interanti, mild-mannered janitor for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth, nonsense, and the American way. And now, another exciting episode in the adventures of I, Walter. Yeah, it is me. It's I, Walter. I am so sorry for myself, I guess, because it's the witching hour. It's 3.33. It can't be any worse than that. And I've been trying to work on this. I've had so many complications and, uh, complications tonight, folks. It's not even funny. I actually intended to start like two hours ago. I had problems. I got a new router box from Verizon, and they sent me out a receipt sticker to put on top of the box, a re- actual receipt. Because when I got, like, they told me, oh, I needed to update my router. My old one was no good. They were not, not going to honor, honor the old router, and they're going to charge me for using it. So they encouraged you. They said, oh, if you get a new router for 60 bucks, you know, the router at home, a wireless router, we will, you know, knock off. It's normally 100 We're going to knock it down to 60 bucks, and all you have to do is return your old one, and we won't charge you that fee for an outdated router because we won't honor it anymore. We're just going to charge you for using it. So it, they, they convinced you to buy one, came in the mail today. It only had taken, I think, a day and a half to come to the ma- um, to the house. And they said, oh, yeah, you just put this label on, shipping label, and you can return it, um, you know, no, free of charge. So I, I stuck the label on there, and it said, uh, your receipt to keep for your records. It was like, okay. So they sent me the wrong receipt out. I mean, the wrong, wrong label. Like, there's a receipt to your label, and it was from UPS. It was like I had a call. Believe it or not, I was able to call them like 1 o'clock in the morning. So I was on the phone for them for about an hour just saying, yeah, just give me a label that I can return this box. I don't want to get charged for it. <coughs> I'm sorry. I'm out of breath now. So I'm extremely tired. I haven't slept right. When I do shows like this, I'm up until 6 in the morning. I mean, I literally, it's broad daylight out by the time I go to bed. So I'm not a happy camper, and I can't keep up with this, but... Yesterday, actually, I don't want to pick on this poor girl, but I did talk to a co-worker at my job, and we got in a long discussion because she's on the opposite um, viewpoints that I am on politics, religion, and everything else. So, I mean, literally like yin and yang, and I, I hate to bring it up. I hope she's not listening. I'm not doing it to offend her. I'm actually, I just couldn't defend myself very well yesterday when I was trying to say, listen, um, you know, her political beliefs were on as far left as you can go, very liberal, and mine are not actually completely towards the right. I think I keep a little bit of an open mind on my political views, religious views, and other um, types of social issues, but, you know, I felt like it was almost really far to the one side um, with, with this girl I was talking to, and God love her, she's a very nice person, just don't share the same views that I do. So I actually spend, believe it or not, on show prep at work because I had some downtime. I spend literally two hours just trying to find, you know, remember everything she had mentioned. I said, yeah, I definitely got to do a podcast with you because you would definitely be a good person to interview considering um, it was a challenge trying to answer her questions or actually come with something to um, support my points. So one thing you do learn in college, this is one thing I've learned, Anytime you um, write a paper and you're trying to, um, you know, create an argument or, you know, something like that, something on that line, uh, create something, you have to support your point. Like, you can't just make uh, points on any topic or issue unless you have, you know, evidence to support that point. Otherwise, you're just basically talking out of your ass. 
So that had taken me at least two hours. I only touched upon a few things. Thank you to my friend Matt Tarns. He actually was able to send a soundbite for me. I actually also, in um, in addition to that two hours, I ripped something to support one of her arguments on uh, Donald Trump's um, wife that she was basically plagiarizing um, Michelle Obama's speech. Parts of uh, Donald Trump's wife was basically, again, um, ripping off or, again, she was plagiarizing um, in a speech that Trump's wife had given um, that it seemed like it would like was word for word. So, actually... Um, Rush Limbaugh kind of spoke about that today for like a good good two solid minutes. He read exactly, you know, um, a, a very clear perspective on that. And I wanted to play that. I actually did because normally I just play big chunks of a, a particular show. If it's, you know, like I think I did something or I mentioned something I actually listened to my friend. He doesn't think I listened to him. My friend Matt, I actually did listen to Dennis Prager one weekend, and I um, either got some sound clip from him or actually did actually kind of uh, reflect upon him. Anyway, in the past, if it's Milo Yiannopoulos, if it's Dennis Prager or Rush Limbaugh, my segments are generally very long. So I made sure just kind of cut to the, the, the point this time, at least the one with Rush Limbaugh. So I got it down to two minutes. Otherwise, it would have been probably four or five. Then I also, in addition to that, I hope I have these lined up. I think I do. Um, I actually do have a story that, thank you again, my friend Matt actually got this for me. So um, I'm looking for it now because I, I kind of cut the stuff at work tonight just to make it a little bit. Um, yeah. Um, Trump's wife is the one. That one's actually stored aside. And then I got one from um, my friend. I actually found articles on it. It was, let me look. Uh, the one in five speculation women have been raped on college campuses. So I want to do a little bit of both because I did do a rip. And I'm trying to look right now because I did a rip. I actually bought this iSoft uh, Sky software for YouTube because there was something, a video a fr my friend Matt sent me from YouTube. And um, yeah, that actually, it's not opening up very well. Um, it was like a five minute segment, which I didn't cut, five minutes and 15 seconds. Now I'm looking for it because I did convert it. It says it, it, now I, that I didn't, but it was converted. Um, convert it. Okay. Yeah, so I don't know why it's not doing it, or why I did not do it. Um, well, I'm going to do it again, and it's called Once Again, but this is like actually a video uh, that I changed, I am changing, into an audio, and it's giving me a really difficult time. So it's not doing it. Um, yeah, I don't know why it's to export output video directly into... Process, export, output, video. I'm trying to do it again. I'm sorry about that, folks. Um, so I'm going to play that, too. I'm just making sure this is doing it correctly. Um, yeah, okay, now finally it's showing up. I couldn't get it before. So I, I got this five minutes. It's going to be a lot longer, obviously, than the Rush Limbaugh. The Rush Limbaugh one, you don't have to worry about. That one's only um, a matter of minutes. So I got those now up and ready to go. So let me look real quick. But the problem is it's going on 4 o'clock, so I'm not a happy camper. I've had so many major problems tonight with everything, and I'm just hoping that something goes right for me at this point. Now my mic's giving me a hard time. It's just like, no, I want to go downwards away from your mouth. I'm telling you, folks, I've had such a bad morning so far. And I'd rather be, you know, I should be sleeping, not doing this crap. Anyway, um, I'm going to go in order. There was a lot of articles, obviously, once again, that I had. Um, so I'm going to kind of go through them as, you know, sift through them as I progress on the show. 
Um, hey, on a lighter note, real quick, let me just get this out because I want this to be basically. It's going to be. It's been a long time since I did one, basically more on political views than anything else. By the way, I saw a really bad car accident on the way to work today. It never. I said it was not going to get posted in the paper, and it did not. Three different cars, each one probably around fifty thousand dollars, brand new cars. There were all three cars had three different, and each car one person per car was a young girl and they smashed their cars going in like five d- different directions it was unbelievable well, it was three different directions all three of them were like totaled um it was at fairview village shopping center right on the top of the hill from where i live and they literally literally totaled their cars and it was like everybody stopped to help them because they were young young girls and probably because of the way they were dressed definitely helped them get a lot of attention from ongoers but it just caused havoc and then there was a person trying to make a left-hand turn which there is a left-hand turn lane turn and lane off of germantown pike around this accident um in the right hand straight away lane so that actually caused could have caused another accident it would have been four accidents because it is a moron so I was almost late for work. There was debris. There was glass. There was trash all over the place. And it was like, you know, you're in the middle of an intersection and you're acting like like the Miss Drama Queens, all three of them. It was a disaster. And it's like, you're going to cause more car accidents just from the way you're acting like such a moron, these people. So, again, it never got published, so um, I'm not surprised, and um, that's just the way things are. You know, if you're if somebody, uh, your parents are of importance, and you don't have to worry about having it uh, publicized. God, I years ago, I was putting the paper every time I did something wrong. Even if I sne- looked wrong or sneezed, I was in the newspaper the next day. I'm, I mean, I literally was. I was the laughing stock um, of my one job at I got at Gary's years ago when I got a confrontation with a cop or a couple cops, and I was a laughing stock in in the um, at my job because they published it in the fucking paper. They literally published it in the paper, and it happened at like one o'clock in the morning. This happened at four fifty in uh, three fifty, or no, yeah, it was around three fifty or something like that. Ten of four, twenty of four. At, at like the busiest time. Oh, we can't publish that. One and two in the morning with Walter. Oh yeah, we can publish that though. But there was nobody on the road except some like um, you know uh, hot headed uh, cops. So yeah, there's a there, it's amazing what uh, money does to um, cover up um, bullshit. Anyway, before again I go into other stuff, Marvel released a new Defenders logo in teaser video. Marvel. The Defenders is a Netflix original. It's going to have the different characters like um, I can't remember. It's in the same universe, so to speak, but it's actually in a different direction. Jessica Jones. I was looking for that. Jeff, Jessica Jones is part of the Defenders, and they're actually now lining up like these different characters um, to make the Defenders. So, you know, they've been very successful with that. I just wanted to throw that in really quick. Um, a leather nonsense note before I go into my more serious stuff really quick. So I'm going to try to do this as quickly and smoothly as possible tonight, considering it's going to be like 9 o'clock by the time I go to bed now. Um, yeah, actually, Hot Topics, now that it's the 22nd, actually did release all their um, like really, really cool stuff for the Suicide Squad, like really bizarre um, actual costumes of the different characters. I actually ordered... The stuff for uh, the Joker. I think Jared Leto, at first I didn't like that whole ghettoed out look that he had, but it really grew on me. And I think now more and more people are like kind of going with that look that Jared Leto is given the new Joker. I think it's just because it's so unique. It's so different. Um, and it stands out much more than any other actor who played the, the part that it just really does grow on you. So I end up having to get that. It's like I go to these comic conventions all the time, and I don't wear it, really wear that much. I'm not going to wear a green wig or anything like that, but I will wear um, part of the attire I had bought now. Because I go at least to at least – I'm not like these other people who go to 365 comic book conventions a year. No, I go to like one or two, and that's that's more than enough for me. 
So, but I, I enjoy, I like enjoying myself when I'm there for those, you know, because I'll go for a couple days now. I won't go just for one day. Sometimes I do. So anyway, going back, um, there was a paper, the Washington Examiner. It was actually Wednesday, July 13th of this year. And it was titled, No, One in Five Women Have Not Been Raped on College Campuses. I will play this segment. I also want to play that segment from Howard, um, Howard Stern from Rush Limbaugh as well. Let me just read a little bit. This is a shock claim that one in five women on college campuses have been sexually assault, assaulted has been parroted by politicians, including President Obama, who are hoping to score points defending women in support of a war against them. So I've said this before. It's between all the minorities. I've actually found articles. Um, actually, one was from a minority but, um, defending white males in the in the South, how they're being heavily discriminated upon now, turned down for job positions just because they're white males. They are the lowest common denominator. You won't hear about that stuff on the news. I'm telling you right now. So anyway, um, it says, but really... This claim is misleading at best. Um, it, you know, what they're trying to say, and this was, again, this was this month. This was published. Um, it has been debunked multiple times, but apparently the paranorma it causes is just too good to let facts get in the way. So it's basically it's all fabricated, so I'm not going to debunk it again. So it goes on. You can look at this at the Washington Examiner. I did read it a little bit earlier, but it's best that if you hear what my friend Matt had sent me. But when I went into it, because I'm not reading it properly, it basically is saying that these um, supposed assaults on women is a bunch, a crock of shit. So the one girl I was talking to, she says, oh, did you see this? There's like an academic, uh, you know, not an academic, but you know what I mean? There's a outbreak that men are just out of control and women are getting raped left and right i'm not safe anymore and it's like she really believed this so it's it is a crock of shit though it's not true um it looks like a different picture but it's the same story so i might have put it up um twice unless it was uh, because it says the washington examiner and again so I'm not going to read what I just read, but I want to play that thing that my friend Matt had sent me tonight. But yeah, that is a total crock of shit. I will play that in just one moment. I also got from the Wall Street Journal an article because I had to like defend myself on everything she was throwing out at me. And it's like, hey, I appreciate, um, what do you call it? The the difference of opinion, um, the challenge she gave me, so to speak, this girl at work, but it's not going to keep me from not trying to go back and trying to find stuff to, that actually truly does support what I was trying to tell her, that I'm not, like, totally nuts. Like, I told her, and she laughed. She, I said to her, hey, you know what, I, I'm gonna, you probably think that I'm so nuts, because I came out with an analysis. Now I forgot to look for it, too. Actually, I'm going to do that right now if I can uh, comparing, um, I think I put in a private message to a friend, so this will actually help me. Um, comparing um, President Obama to Adolf Hitler, and the way I did it was not a very good way, but there is an analysis that was actually speculated in an article, so I'm not just making this stuff up. I'm not, like, talking through my ass on this stuff. So I got to look for that. Now, you're going to probably say, yeah, you're nuts, because um, she actually said, well, Obama didn't kill, like, try to genocide, a, you know, the Jewish population. No, he didn't. It's you got to understand what I was going with that with her was um, Obama's doing using the same tactic. The Democrats have been doing this for years, or, which is the same tactic, by the way, that Adolf Hitler used a long, long you know, years ago back um, during World War II. Okay, my thing just shut down. And it's not opening up. Okay, I just got to make sure my... I'm having a fun time tonight. Everything that could possibly go wrong is absolutely going wrong for me. So, um, I mean, I'm multitasking in so many different directions. not funny. So I'm looking for this article. Here we go. 13 similarities between Obama and Hitler. My speculation or my analysis on what's going on, he is purely using Obama. And this is there's no way to hide the fact he's actually using 
um, propaganda. The media just backs him up because he's an African-American. They will not touch him. They put him on a pedestal no matter what he does wrong. So I had to look for something to back up my speculation. Maybe it doesn't do it directly, but it does do a comparison between President Obama and Adolf Hitler. Again, it's, it's titled 13 similarities, similar, similarities Between Obama and Hitler. My speculation or my analysis was that basically, if this is a nonsense article, that's one thing. But my analysis is he is using the media exactly the way Adolf Hitler did. Hitler took a country, Germany, that was actually in a major um, recession, a major depression. They were like basically... Um, They were like we are now. He's putting us in that same situation. You're not seeing it because there's nobody that's homeless or starving or without a car, without a phone or without a house. That's all being given to them through um, our taxes and through the government basically enabling these people not to work. But if you take that all away, we're in the same situation Germany was. But how um, how this is all brought about is through. Um, President Obama, he just he gives these speeches the same way Hitler did to, you know, show that who the the, the white male is the evil person. Um, our analysis on this one percent of the that the run this country, the white male, how they are destroying everything, how we need to change history. Hitler did something very similar. He used though he used his power of of. Um, being filmed, being on TV, which I don't think they had TV. It was more propaganda through film and media, um, I mean, in paper, press, and stuff like that. But it worked very w- well for Adolf Hitler. It's working very well for President Obama. He just puts himself, you know, he's got that, that joke about the teleprompter all the time. He's always making these long speeches that are drawn out. He's always making it how, you know, Things are getting better and how things are much, um, you know, he's trying to he's trying to change things, but he's being held back. But the way he presents himself behind this podium and in front of the, um, the television all the time is reminds me when I was younger watching those speeches from Adolf Hitler. It looks like the same thing to me. So I did find this article again. Look for Now the End Begins. I know it sounds like a ridiculous site, but it says... 13 similarities between Obama and Hitler, a factual, it says factual comparison. So I definitely post that on my Facebook page. You will find me on Walter Interante. So just look for that. My last name is I-N-T-E-R-R-A-N-T-E. I'm not that hard to find. Trust me. Um, so that, that was that. I want to get into this story, by the way. I really do want to get into this story about... Um, this misconception about women um, on campus as girls getting raped. And you please listen to it very closely because I think you'll find it um, not only factual, but it's very entertaining. Yeah, actually, I did find two stories. They got different links almost, but it's the same exact story. It's kind of weird. One was from the Washington Examiner. The other one was from um, SocialLeague.com or something, Ledge. Well, no, so called ledge. Oh, yeah, so called ledge.com. The truth behind the one in five women are assaulted on campus statistics. So, anything I read or say is going to be all in this audio soundbite that I just made made for myself so I could put it on my show. It would make it a lot more quicker, too, trust me. Um, otherwise, which it is already, it's going to be, it is, and it will be very redundant. But I think um, the clarity from this woman who put this thing on YouTube will make it a lot more um, clear for you to understand and see where I'm going with this. And I do want to, maybe I'll wait until I come back. I want to read this next after playing the soundbite. Thanks to Matt. And I will read the name of that soundbite in one moment. Um, the wage gap myth that won't die. And that was actually printed also. Well, that was printed like two years ago, but it's worse now. And it's paying the, the wage gap that that misconception that there's this massive wage gap between men and women. And there is not. And they give statistics. I um, want to read that, too. 
So anyway, what I'm going to play right now is called Are One in Five Women Raped at College? With an explanation point. Please, please listen to this woman. Caroline, looks like Kitchens is her name. It really is like a kitchen. Caroline Kitchens, American Enterprise, whatever. I just missed it. I'm going to see if I can find, go back a little bit and see what it says. Oh, shoot, I just missed it again. Uh, Enterprise Institute. So please listen to Caroline and let me know what you think. Um, You know, women just, uh, people love to be victimized. I don't care who you are. Once you're victimized, then you have, you. you, what do you do that for? Because you want people to feel sorry for you. And this is exactly the situation that's going on right now. You know, it's every different perspective of life. People just want to be felt sorry. Have have a pity party given to them. Anyway, let me play it now. Here we go. It's a you know soundbite from Caroline. It's like five minutes long, five minutes and fifteen seconds. So let me know what you think. Are American college campuses rape cultures? Are they dangerous places where sexual assaults against women are happening at an alarming rate? According to many gender activists, academics, and politicians, the answer is yes. Here's what the Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden, said in 2014. We know the numbers. One in five of every one of those young women who is dropped off for that first day of school before they finish school will be assaulted, will be assaulted in her college years. Let's take a closer look at the Vice President's claim. Rape is a horrific crime, and rapists are rightfully despised. We have strict laws against sexual assault that everyone wants to see enforced. But while rape is certainly a very serious problem, there is simply no evidence of a national campus rape epidemic. And there is certainly no evidence that sexual violence is a cultural norm in 21st century America. In fact, rates of rape in the U.S. are very low and they've been declining for decades. Why would it be any different on a college campus? Where then does the one in five rate that Vice President Biden cites come from? Well, it turns out it comes from a study conducted over the Internet at two large universities, one in the Midwest and one in the South. The survey was anonymous, no one's claims were verified, and terms were not clearly defined. In round numbers, a total of 5,000 women participated. Based on their responses, the authors, not the participants, determined that 1,000 had been victims of some type of non-consensual or unwanted sexual contact. And voila! From one vaguely worded, unscientific survey, we suddenly arrive at a rape culture on college campuses. Tellingly, the study authors have since explicitly stated that it's inappropriate to use their survey to make that claim. Much more comprehensive data from the U.S. Bureau of Justice Statistics, or BJS, estimates that about 1 in 52.6 college women will be victims of rape or sexual assault over the course of four years. That's far too many, but it's a long way from one in five. The same BJS data also reveal that women in college are safer from rape than college-aged women who are not enrolled in college. But the truth doesn't serve the purposes of feminist activists or vote-seeking politicians. Lies work much better, and the one in five claim is tantamount to a lie. Here are just a few examples of what this lie has wrought. At Scripps College, Pulitzer Prize-winning commentator George Will was disinvited from giving a speech. The reason? He had dared to question the rape culture mantra in a column he wrote. At the all-women Wellesley College, students demanded that the administration remove a campus sculpture of a sleepwalking man wearing only underpants. Why? Well, because the image of a nearly naked male could trigger memories of sexual assault for victims. According to Harvard Law professor Jeannie Suk, students now ask teachers not to include questions about rape law on exams for fear that such disturbing questions might cause them to perform less well. And at Brown University, students were so traumatized by a debate on the subject of campus sexual assault that activists organized a safe room equipped with coloring books, Play-Doh, calming music, and a video of frolicking puppies. No less absurd are the attempts by colleges and legislators to cure this non-existent plague. In California and New York, students now have to live by so-called affirmative consent laws. 
The California law says that affirmative consent by all parties must be ongoing throughout a sexual activity, while the New York law says that silence or lack of resistance in and of itself does not demonstrate consent. Confused? Pity the poor college students who have to figure this out. If it wasn't so serious, it would be laughable. But it's not funny to a growing number of young men who find themselves accused of sexual assault, publicly shamed, and then brought before campus judicial panels that are guided by rape culture theory. In such proceedings, due process is an afterthought. It's guilty because accused. But here's the best way to prove that the one in five number is phony. Ask yourself this question. Would you send your daughter to a place for four years where there was a 20% chance she would be raped or sexually assaulted? Of course not. Good rarely, if ever, comes from lies. The one in five rape culture lie is no exception. I'm Caroline Kitchens of the American Enterprise Institute for Prager University. Okay. Hey, folks, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I listened to it earlier. I kind of just fast for, you know, I got to the end of that because right now it's four o'clock and I'm trying to get this thing moving as smoothly as possible. But yeah, give me your opinion. I think that um, Caroline did a very good job explaining things, which I could do, but I'm not going to do that great of a job, especially at this time in the morning. So, I mean, you know, again, I have to prove myself that I'm not a total nutcase. I actually wrote my one friend's brother, and we were just going back and forth online about a lot of this stuff. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I was kind of glad because he so he told me, no, you're not nuts, Walter. I, you know, you're 100% right on everything you said. It's not that I want to hear myself. I don't want to hear praise for myself. Trust me. That's what people are going to say. Oh, well, you just want to hear yourself. Um, no, I don't want to hear myself. Um, I'm just telling you, telling people the truth that all this, um, yes, connect. Sorry, I'm trying to read this story now. But at work, it let me read it. Now it's not let me read it. Uh, the wage gap myth, um, that won't die. And it was, it was working perfectly fine. Now it's asking for a subscription for some reason because it was from the Wall Street Journal. Um, or sign in. I'll just sign in. See if I can do this. Um, now it's not working properly. Why is it doing this to me? To read for story, subscribe or sign in. Okay, I'm sorry about that because this story actually worked earlier, and it's just going back to other stories about Trump and stuff. So, um. Hey, I have nothing against Trump. I do want to play that segment with Trump's wife, by the way, that I heard on how uh, Rush Limbaugh today. Why this is giving me such a hard time now, I don't know why, because it worked perfectly fine at work Fine at work today. Let me see if I can pull it up on my, my other computer. I don't re- really like doing this because it's the one I'm recorded on as well. So it kind of takes something away from my um, my setup. So forgive me for a minute. It should have not been this hard because I had everything lined up the way I wanted it to work. And then I run into complications as always. And there was another one I wanted to, you know, try to explain to the girl at work. And it was just not really very effective about these mosques coming up in the U.S. Okay. Now it's working on this one kind of. Anyway, let me go back. And it says the wage gap myth that won't die. You have... You have to ignore many variables to think women are paid less than men. California is happy to try. So this article was written about two years ago, but it's gotten much, much worse. I mean, two years ago is not that long. No, actually, yeah, it's about two years ago. When it comes to economically economically foolish laws, California is the second is second to none. A good example in California, fair pay the Fair Pay Act, which government Jerry Brown is expected to sign into coming days. I don't know if he's still in office in California, but that's what it's saying for this article that was dated September 30th of 2015, actually. So it's like about a year old. Somewhere I I thought it said two years, but it's only one year. This bill, which uh, the California uh, Senate anonymously passed in August, is a state version of, of the Paycheck Fairness Act 
that the U.S. Congress rejected in 2014. That's where I got up with that number. Like its national counterpart, it is an aggressive attempt to eradicate a wage gap between men and women that allegedly is due to discrimination in the workplace. But the wage gap is illusionary, and the legislation will have unintended consequences, consequences, including for women. Uh, the Fair Act pay will prohibit employees from paying men and women different wages for substantially sim- similar work. Um, at first glance, this pro um, ambition might appear reasonable. Government data for 2014 shows that women in California earn an average of 84 cents for every dollar earned by men. Nationally, women earn about 79 cents for every dollar earned by men. Okay, I understand. This is what it's saying, but it gets into where I want to go. But at um, but a closer look reveals a in a different picture. The Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is BLS, notes that this analysis of wage by genders does not control for many factors that can be significant in explaining earning differences. So what are these factors? Uh, Start with hours worked. Full-time employment is technically defined as more than 35 hours a week. This raises the obvious problem. A simple side-by-side comparison of all men and all women include people who work 35 hours a week and others who work 45. Men are significantly more likely than women to work longer hours, according to the BLS. And if compared to only people who work 40 hours a week, the BLS data shows that women then earn on average, 90 cents for every dollar earned by men. Career choices is another factor. Research in 2013 by Anthony, um, can't pronounce a name, from Georgetown University um, Economist shows that women flock to college majors that lead to lower play- paying careers. Of the 10 lowest paying majors, such as drama and art, uh, theater arts, which actually I kind of... Um, majored in in counseling counseling in psychology uh, counseling psychology which i kind of majored in that too only one theology and religious vocations is uh a majority male so i'm sorry for not reading this correctly it was in the wall street journal so that, that's obviously a little bit higher um cal- you know it's written for a higher intelligence level i don't know a higher reading level i should actually say Controversially, of the 10 highest paying majors, including mathematics and computer science and petroleum engineering, only one pharmaceutical si- pharmacy science and um, administration is uh, majority female. Eight of the remaining nine are more than 70% male. Other factors that account for earning differences include marriage and children, both of which cause many women to leave the workforce for years. June O'Neill, former director of the Congress Building and Office, concluded in 2005, a 2005 study, that there is no gender gap in wages among men and women with similar family roles. Time magazine reported in 2010 that 98% of Americans America's largest 150 cities, including my hometown of Los Angeles, which this was written in, single women under the um, under 30 actually earn on average 8% more than male counterparts. So that misconception that men, I mean, women are making less money than men, which I always knew this was the fact, they're actually, it says, once again, let me reread this, single women under the age of 30 actually earn an average of 8% more than their male counterparts. So that being said, it's completely different. So it goes on. This is a, well, it's not too much longer, but you get my gist. It's, It's basically the whole thing is no more than a crock of shit. I've said this in the past, and I do agree with that. So and there was other things I pulled up I'm going to go into, but I do want to play that segment from Rush Limbaugh to clarify that with Trump's wife. Um, one was America 
Americans not in the labor force exceeded 93 million for the first time, 62.7 labor force uh, participation match, 37-year time all low. So I forget when this was dated. This was actually last year. So that was from CNS and News. The number of Americans 16 years and older who did not participate in the labor force Um, meaning they neither had a job nor actively sought one out in the last four weeks, rose from 92 million, almost 93 million, to almost over 93 million, close to 94 million. That was last year. Um, This was the first time in the number of Americans out out of the labor force has exceeded 93 million. It's actually over surpassed 93 million. This was April of last year. So here you go again. All this stuff, well, Obama's actually bringing more people. They're, uh, you know, you look at the unemployment rate, they're going to claim, well, the unemployment rate's actually um, at 5.5%. No, it's actually over 10%. It's way over 10%. So, um, you know, so you got to read through all this bullshit that you hear about Obama being such a um, such a savior because he's not. Um, let's see. I'm trying to go through a couple of these smaller ones. Um, CNS News again. Debt under Obama has is up. Um, I think it's eight billion dollars. The debt of the federal government has now increased by more than eight billion dollars during the time. President Barack Obama has been in office, according to official debt numbers published in the U.S. Treasury. So apparently this debt that has been accumulated by Bush has been doubled in seven and a half years. Now, Bush was in um, in his second term. It was in the money he accumulated, which was ten million dollars, was accumulated approximately over eight years. And um, Obama's actually... Um, succeeded of actually making that goal actually of November 25th on November 25th of 2015 he actually successfully not even starting his seventh or eighth year had a, a triple you know basically tripled or no not tripled he doubled the debt that supposedly that was made by Bush so whatever Bush was left from his predecessors was at the 10 billion dollar mark is now, um, did I say million? So I meant uh, billion. So it went from $10 billion to $8 billion more in debt. So that was just accumulated from one man, not from multiple predecessors, you know, his 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 other people, the other people that were president before Obama. He's actually successfully doubled the debt from $10 billion to um $18 billion. I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, that's just... and You can't hide facts, folks. Um, let me see. Well, maybe I... You know what? I could have been off on those numbers. Let me look at this one. So I apologize. Washington Times. So I get these numbers mixed up. It's actually, believe it or not, it's trillion. Uh, $20 trillion man. National debt nearly doubles during Obama's... Uh, presidency. So I'm not getting closer to the uh, Rush Limbaugh thing, but I will. You're, I just need to put a little bit of a space between my that other one. So I'm, I've been fucking up on these numbers, so I apologize. You know, hey, this is just a goofy podcast, but I am trying to support my point. But by the way, this might be no, it's not much better. This other one from the Washington Times was November 1st of last year. And it was in the Washington Times again. So I was wrong with the billion. It is trillion, which is actually much worse. This one's easier to read, at least. So this is good for me. When President Obama signs into law the two uh, new two-year budget deal Monday, his actions will bring into a sharper focus part of his legacy that doesn't um, like to talk that he doesn't like to talk about. He is now the twenty trillion dollar man. I'm going to get something to drink. So it's basically saying Mr. Obama is spending uh, spending an agreement with Congress will suspend the nation's uh, yeah, suspend the nation's debt limit and allow the Treasury to borrow another one point five trillion 
or so by the end of his presidency in 2017, add it to the current total national debt of more than 18.15 trillion, the red link will likely be crowded, uh, crowding, uh, crowding the 20 trillion mark around the time that Obama leaves the White House. So yes, I screwed up twice, and it, actually it was much better because at first I said million, then I said billion, and it's actually trillion. So yes, Bush left us with a big debt of ten trillion dollars. Well, Obama successfully has doubled that now. Now, was this debt that uh, President Bush, this ten trillion, was this all by Bush, or is this from? Again, which I assume it had to be from the other presidents, because I thought that's what I saw. So, I mean, you're talking like Clinton, you're talking Bush number one, and then you're talking um, Bush number two, that, you know, that this debt has gotten this out of hand. You're talking prior presidents up until Bush number two had left office. The mark was at... Ten trillion dollars. Now it's at twenty. It will be at. It will be at twenty trillion from one man, and it's from all these these things that he has started. These different, um, you know. Um, I had one on the Affordable Health Care Act too, by the way, and how much that is just a, a disaster. Um, the, yeah, here it is: the emerging disaster of Obamacare. Seven years on. The size of Obamacare disaster is only only beginning to emerge. Fixing it won't be easy, as some of the candidates for president seem to think it will be. The Congress, uh, Congressional Budget Office estimated last week that over the next, and it's from the Washington Times. Let me look at the date for this one, too. It was actually March Thursday, March 31st of this year, though it's a very recent one. Um... Let me reread this now. Seven years on, the size of the Obamacare disaster is only beginning to emerge. Fixing it won't be easy, as some of the candidates for president seem to think it will be. The Congressional Budget Office estimates last had estimated last week that overall, the next decade, Obamacare will add $1.4 trillion to the national debt. So, see, remember I mentioned about $1.4 trillion more added on, which will make his debt into $20 trillion that he's left behind. That is because of that Obamacare. That was a complete disaster area. Um, many of the so-called cures are utterly unrealistic. Hillary Clinton, for example, after proposing new and expensive additions to Obamacare, now suggests a solution to concentrate... Uh, um, of, you know, basically, she's just going to put you into more debt um, on part fantasy and two parts nonsense. She would impose a 4% tax on millionaires to pay for this increase of cost. So this is her solution for this ever increase in debt that Obama's left us with. And this is what Hillary is going to do. She's going to actually make it even harder on people. Uh, and definitely those that are quote unquote um, billionaires. But you know what? That's like less than 0.1% that fit into that category. But her tax would yield only $150 billion over 10 years, a fraction of what the plan would require even millionaires, millionaires won't. Um, millionaires are not what they used to be. So you know what happens? A lot of these billionaires, obviously, are probably people that own companies, or you know, these individuals own companies. And what do they do? Well, these companies or these people that own these companies, they leave the country, and they they don't not only take themselves out of the the picture, they also take their business out of are um, out of the U.S., and what does that leave us with? Less employment. That means the people that work under these billionaires are also going to be out of jobs, the, the people that work for these companies. So it's it's like it's going to be a total disaster area. Um, Sylvia Matthews, 
Burwell, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, said last year that Obamacare, the Obamacare website, the heart of the president's scheme, cost $834 million to build. Bloomsburg News put the cost at $2.1 billion, and at any price it re- represents the obstacle to medical progress, the exchanges that were crucial to in, um, just incur- um Crucial to this encouraging, the competition that would lower cost have been another disaster. So I misread that, but basically they're saying this was supposed to lower the cost of health care, and it's actually done, has done the total opposite, by the way. All but 12 of the original 23 have failed, and congressional critics say that the $1.2 billion lent to them is unlikely ever to be repaid back. Um, it says Obamacare promises to ensure Americans who had no health care insurance is increasingly uh, is increasingly suspect of more than 11 million who signed up by the end of the enrollment period last year. Three million had dropped out by the end of the year. So this was supposed to help fix 11 million people without health insurance. And out of those 11 million, 3 million already had dropped out because it's costing them money as well. Um, the Heritage Foundation estimate, estimates that the full quarter of those eligible either didn't buy a plan or later dropped out. Um, the president's most memorable promise that Obamacare would not dis, uh, disrupt existing doctor patient health care um, insurance. Um, Arguments has long since evaporated. Insurers continue to drastically reduce the choice of doctors and hospitals. The industry trying to sugarcoat the label of disaster caused this narrowing network. The Heritage Foundation says fewer choices lie in the wait up for the consumer in the future. There's more to go on, but I'm not going to read it. This was, again, on the Washington Times. So I have to back this up because she was actually the girl I talked to was trying to say how, how great this is, um, this this Obamacare. It was a necessary thing. Well, no, it isn't. Actually, it is a, I tried to explain her it was a total disaster, uh, and I didn't do a very good job reading it. So just go to my Facebook page, but you will see by what I tried to read that it has been a complete, total disaster. There is nothing good in that Obamacare. It's actually made things worse. I even tried to explain to her, I have a friend who had, he's a self-employed person. He owns his own business. He pays for his own insurance. And the insurance company had to drop drop him because they said, we can't afford to keep you on the plan you're on and give you the same um, coverage that you had. So he's paying more for a far, far less than what he had before. So that was another thing. Now, I'm going a little bit more in this direction on these stories because I just can't stop. They're just all so, you know, the total opposite from what I had discussed with this girl yesterday. I apologize. It's actually two days ago, so it was on a Wednesday. So here's some other ones. I try to go into, you know, she had this discussion like um, about religion, and she feels like, well, people should be able, you know, we shouldn't have be forced to um, have told to us that we need to uh, pledge allegiance to the flag. Now that she used that one or that we have to say prayer in school or something. Well, you know what? That is part of, you know, just something that was the norm for so many years. And my comeback was, well, you know what? It's OK um, for the Muslims to built mosque in the U.S. That's that's all right because like they spend billions of dollars, millions of dollars, on making these mosques in airports and other places. But hey, if you like, I forget what particular airport I'm thinking of. It happened somewhere. They were putting a, like a large amount of money into a mosque in an airport um, where there was a terrorist attack just recently. So I can't remember which one of them because there has been one almost every month now since. You know, Obama stepped up his whole thing about allowing the migrants, these Muslims, 
you know, how they're victims and things like that, that um, terrorist attacks around the globe have to back uh, have picked up, including the U.S. You know, so. But you know what? If if I was like, I'm Christian, if I say, hey, I want to put a church inside the airport, will you fund this? I would get shot down because it would be fine. It would be found to be. Um, I'm trying to think of the right word. It would be f- found. Um, offensive to someone especially the muslims so i found a ton of articles on that and i don't know which one to start with on this whole mosque thing so i'm going to try to just go through a few of them because i do want to get back to this thing on um to clarify this thing with what happened to trump's wife as well okay here's one from top news the top right news obama spent 770 million um dollars in taxpayer cash to renovate mosque overseas. This is no joke. This was actually written. You didn't build that or wait till you do uh, did. You know, Obama's little spiel on that. A CBS News investigation found that Obama's State Department is sending hundreds of millions of dollars to save mosque overseas. Outraging taxpayer payer advocates and raising enormous questions about the aid to potential terror supporting groups with U.S. foreign aid. So he's put, again, $770 million of our taxpayer money he's sent it overseas to rebuild these mosques overseas or built more of them. So there you go. There's another one that our lovely president, who's so such a messiah, um, I consider him almost at this point an antichrist, but that's besides the point, that this man is a total hypocrite, by the way, too. And the people who support him are as well, in my opinion. Let's see. Here's another one. France raids mosque. What they found inside proves Trump right with an explanation point. This was another article from thepoliticalinsider.com. If I can get it to open up, it would be very nice. Let's see if it's going to go. Um, yeah, once again, France raids mosque. That's what it's titled. What they found inside proves uh, Trump to be correct. The deadly Islamic terrorist attacks in Paris, France, killed more than 130 people, unlike America. Um, After an attack, France started immediately raiding Islamic mosque, or raiding, I'm sorry, raiding Islamic mosque to see what they found inside. After all, far too many people in the Muslim community have not been helpful with bringing forth information to authorities. And those... Um, while those French investors have been called racist, um, this particular these particular mosque raided uh, that they had raided this past week. When was this dated, though? I'm sure it's got to be new. This just happened not too long ago. Where's the date on this thing? Um, let's see what people. Well, it says July twenty seventeenth. Uh, so yeah, it was like you know it was the other day. This story had came about. From the Political Insider. And let's see, where did I leave off? Bringing forth information to authorities. And while those French investigators were considered racist um, for raiding these mosques, what they found in uh, a large collection of 7.62 um, was basically, it says ammo along with boxes of Islamic State ISIS, pardon me about that, ISIS propaganda videos. So they did, after this terrorist attack in France, they decided, hey, we're going to start invading these mosques on our on our French soil. What they found inside, again, what they found was 7.62, um, you know, amount of ammo, 7.62, it, it says, cal- I can't pronounce that word, I apologize, along with boxes of Islamic State ISIS propaganda videos. So are you going to blame this on um, President Bush, too? Because the girl I talked to said that she's one of these people, like I've heard on the radio, and I, it's the first time I've actually heard somebody actually say this, that she is still continuing to blame all this on President Bush. Bush has been out of office for eight years. These problems didn't stir up until years after he was gone, and it just escalated under Obama, who just makes everybody feel like they're victimized. It says, uh, France isn't messing messing around. They've arrested more than 230 
230 Muslims and collected more than 324 weapons. Many others under travel bans and house arrests. They have shut down three mosques and have raided more than 2,300 homes. This is what they dug up from these Muslims that are so uh, innocent and, you know, they're just being um, pushed, you know, put out like they are they are guilty of something. Well, they are. They are, um, da- and you know, oh, they're not dangerous. You're just saying that because they're Muslim. You don't understand the Muslim state. They're a peaceful group of people. Well, you know what? You can say that I'm... Um, what do you call it? I'm making a general statement that, hey, they're not, but when when they're proving me right, how? what else am I supposed to think that these are? you got to take them. you got to, um, what do you call it? You know, oh, we can't, um, I can't think of the right word right now, folks. Like when you um, basically judge somebody from who, what their background is, whatever. I can't think of that proper word. My friend Matt would come up with it right away. Um, you know, profiling. You know, oh, we can't profile these Muslims. Well, yeah, you actually, you, France has just, it's not the U.S. who did this. It was France who had profiled these people. And what did they find? They found um, terroristic uh, intent underneath of these mosques and in their homes as well of these Muslims. So, yeah, I think we do need to profile certain people. And they did it to themselves. We did not do it for them. They did that themselves. Here's an article I found, by the way, in the same line, because I do want to go once again to that thing from Rush. New York Post article, and this was like, how old is this one? April 16th of 2016, how Saudi, Saudi, um, Saudi Arabia dangerously undermines the United States. And it's about the mosque situation again. Iran is our um, external enemy uh, um, of the moment. Saudi Arabia is our enduring in, um, internal enemy already within our borders and permitted to poison American Muslims with the wannabe, I can't, wannabe cult, wannabe cult. Um, so, oh, and Saudi Arabia also the spring from which the bloody waters of the global jihadist flown, uh, flood, uh, whatever. But it's actually in the New York Post, by the way. This is one I want to mention, too, again. Let's see. But there was something in this, but it's, again... You know what? I might just let this one go. Check it out, but... I would say there was something in this article I saw that was really interesting. I can't remember now. I apologize. I am all over the place, all over the place, because it is going like um, the sun will be coming up soon, and I will not be a happy camper. But again, the reason I am doing this show tonight, I just want to like um, mention a point that everything that this girl had mentioned to me, and um, that I basically don't see the whole picture, you know, that she is truly, you know, she said she um, does not believe in God. She um, is more of a liberal. She thinks that Republicans are basically, you know, that percentage of Republicans are just made up of old people that own, basically own all the money in the United States, and they just don't want to keep it within their own pockets. They don't want to share anything. And they want to keep not only the wealth, but the power within themselves. And that is not true at all. That is like far from the truth. That whole, that's a misconception you, you learn about on by these, these um, radio stations that are liberals. I saw this w- really interesting site that I had to put on barenakeddisarm.com or something like that. It says, uh, March 29th of this year, Barack Hussein Obama to open Turkey's one million monster mosque, the largest jihad indoctrination center in America. Uh, um, It says, America's largest mosque complex, officially known as the Turkish American Culture and Civilization Center, was built with Turkish funding under the supervision of the Turkish Religious Foundation. Um, the $100 million mega mosque in Liam, Liam, it looks like Liam, Liam, Maryland, will soon be open 
for Muslims um, supremacists in Washington, D.C. area. So there you go. It says Barack Hussein Obama, once again, this is what it says, its title, to open Turkish uh, Turkey's $1 million monster mosque, and it's going to be right outside of, according to this, outside of Washington, D.C. area. So there you go. We, You know, hey, you know, you know, you may not believe in religion. Well, if you don't believe in religion, you should not, not also should also not believe in the religion of um, the Muslim beliefs. So the way I seen it, when, you know, I'm not. I might be putting words in this girl's mouth, and I don't mean to do that. But she seems to shoot down every other religion except the one from the Muslims, because the Muslims are the ones that are victimized. Well, they're the ones who are the ones killing everyone as well. So it doesn't make any sense. It's like it's double speak. It really is. Um, so let me go over. I'm going to try to finally let's see where I'm at. Because I also had one on that misconception of about um, cops killing only black men and how they're victimized, too, how black men are always victimized. Oh, here is one, by the way, before I even go that far. This is another one I got. Mosque behind jihad attacks in America. This was from Breitbart. So that's a paper I um, also look for a source. New York Times reported Thursday that in the last two or three months, Chattanooga, gunman Mohammed Yuhaf Abizdez, whatever, had begun showing up rather regularly at Friday prayer at an Islamic society of the greater Chattanooga, a large mosque and culture center, said Dr. Um, Azar S. Shiki, founding member of the center's board. This is actually a very long, lengthy article you can read because I've really screwed it up. But it's from Breitbart. I put that actually on my Facebook page. Um... Now, this one was kind of interesting, too. I, f- I try to look for really good articles. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm postponing once again. I apologize. Making sure. Um, Saudi prince pledges $32 billion to promote Islam Sharia, Sharia, you know, that Sharia law in the U.S. This is, this is a story. It actually says in America. This was actually posted like last year, though. Saudi prince, um, senior member of the Saudi uh, monarchy, says he he um, sure it says she her pledge thirty two billion to advance um, Islamiz- Islamization of America. So you know, hey, we're supposed to be freedom of religion, but the only one that's actually been um, presented to most Americans nowadays, the one that seems to hold presidents or what not presidents, presence in the United States or you know uh, a forefront is this whole thing about Islam and um, the Sharia law. You know the the thing on on what um, the Muslim belief is. Nothing else. Christianity is out the pit, out the door, or any other type of religion. Like um, there may be out there they they don't they don't hold any ground only the one that hey but you know freedom of religion hey we're allowed to practice no we're not actually and everything else gets shot down anyway i also got in discussion i forgot to look for that i had a discussion about um the confederate flag with this girl and she basically said that the confederate flag would be like having that um held up at a government building be like putting up the flag the british flag and it's like no and i try to explain to her this is part of the american history i don't care what you think it stands for i don't particularly i'm I'm not that fond i don't find it that impressive the confederate flag but that is part of our history and now you're telling me that we need to rewrite history because that you find offensive that's what i try to tell her um it says this is a Mother of all bombs in the information battle space. Look as if we're keeping busy for quite some time. The Saudis have spent 
billions already, 80% of the mosques built in America are Saudi-funded. So they're basically quickly taking over our country because of Obama allowing this to happen. And they're, um, the girl I talked to said how Obama is basically, um, you know, he's being held back because the House and Senate now has been taken over by a majority of Republicans. Well, you know why that happened? Because people like myself had made sure when we had our local um, elections, you know, the ones locally, I made sure I could vote out um, in every aspect. And many other people thought the same way, way I do. We wanted to get rid of a lot of these Democrats that were holding House seats and even local um, our local elections. We try to get rid of as many um, Democrats as possible. And I, I make sure to do that every time I can. Trust me. So they're, they're not just like, oh, well, the Republicans just took over because they, you know, hey, they own all the money. It had nothing to do with money. It had everything to do with people actually making a change because they were sick and tired of what's going on. So we'll see what happens in November, though. It says the Saudi... Okay, I already read that. We can look forward to $32 billion more of the kingdom's brand of Islam while censoring criticism of Islam. Um, and it's not just the media that is on the receiving end of the blood money, but also Muslim brother, Brotherhood fronts like CAIR, which spends millions winning about uh, lucrative the Islamophobia business, it, the Islamophobia is. Sorry, I really, really screwed that up. So the bottom line is they're putting billions now, billions of dollars into these mosques all over the U.S. I mean, what is that telling you? They are solely, they are taking over our country, country, and we're allowing it because we're so, you know, we have to be, we're so worried about being politically correct. And look where it's got it, gotten us. Absolutely, like, in total chaos in this country. I said this is going to be a civil war before the end of all this, and I really believe this. Now, here's another thing, like, the girl I talked to, there was another thing I have to prove, and I did prove it now, that the white male population is still um, the minor- a majority of this country. Well, that's been proven wrong. Starting this year, minorities will outnumber whites in. This is actually written, let's see. Actually, it was just two years ago. So, you know, I mean, it's two years, August 19th, 2014, this had been written. Starting this year, minorities will outnumber whites in U.S. public schools, while 60% of the U.S. population was clarified as non-Hispanic whites in 2013. When public schools start this fall, their racial landscape will reflect a different America. So it goes on to say, but again, we are now, especially the white male, has become um, increasingly a, a minority group, even though we're considered still the majority. And by the way, they said with the white population, supposedly, um, the the birth to death rate, the death rate is higher than the birth rate. So we're slowly, um, we're we're becoming a dying breed. The um the white, Anglo slack. How do you say that? Uh, the Caucasian population is slow or quickly starting to decrease because the amount of births that we're replacing the ones that are dying is. Um, much smaller. So the birth rate is smaller and the death rate is much higher for the white Caucasians. So anyway, it says, according to a new report by the National Census, which was was two years ago, sent us National Center for Education Minorities, Hispanics, Asians, African Americans, Native Americans, and multi-racial individuals will account for 50.3% 50.3% of public school students. To break this down by grade levels, minorities will make up 51% of pre-kindergarteners and 8th graders and 8th uh, graders and 48% of 9th to 12th graders. So it's increasing and I think it was like I they gave some article I found by the next 10 or, tw- or 20 or 30 years 
we will definitely be almost near extinction as far as Caucasians go. So, and here's another one. Since I'm on this, I'm trying to keep it pretty consistent if I can. Where am I at? Okay, I'm over an hour. Let's see if I can open this up. This was something written by, I think, probably a minority, and it was called The Race Card Project. So it doesn't go in the, the direction I thought it was going to go. I just thought it was very, very interesting that they wrote this. So this is from an individual who actually has a, their own webpage. They call it The Race Card Project.com. Southern white male Americans most discriminated upon. This is what they titled it. So I like the, what they wrote, so I have to read this. I believe Southern white males are Americans most uh, the are Americans most discriminated against in reality. I am not a white male. For example, at my job, they are openly promoting people because they are women, black, or Hispanic. This is what this person wrote on their web page that they made. They actually have a real nice, it's not like some generic web page. It's actually pretty fancy. Anyway, they go on to say, I see many talented white guys get passed up for promotions because of management needs. Uh, the statistics saying they are promoting minorities, quote unquote. Um, I think such unfair fair promotions hurt all races. I've said this before and I get shot down for saying this. However, you won't see a lawsuit against that sort of unfair promotion because it would be laughed out of the court despite company memos and websites starting that that is what they are doing, stating that that's, this is what they're doing. So, see, you're hearing something from a minority actually admitting, like, listen, this is, this is like what's really what I'm saying. And this is from a minority, though. They're saying that they actually do see... Um, Basically, because I, I actually posted that too, a reverse discrimination is what's going on right now. But this person actually wrote this. Let me go back. Um, let me see. Let me go back and kind of read a little bit. Um, however, you won't see the lawsuits against that sort of unfair promotion because it would be laughed out of courts despite company memos and websites stating that this is what is what they are doing i myself once assumed that i that because a friend was from alabama and had an accent that he was racist because he had an accent he was considered racist i was wrong so this person used to believe like they actually came to realization, listen, um, I just assume that if you're a white guy and you have an, a southern accent, you're automatically a racist and that you don't deserve these promotions. And I'm assuming this is what they're saying, but now they think differently. So I have to thank that person who wrote that and was on the racecard.com on their own. Um, they, they, they made their own, what do you call it, web page. And I, I do appreciate that. I did actually give a link. It was from uh, Wikipedia. You can always go by that, but it does explain for those who don't know what reverse discrimination is all about. So you can see that against members of dominant or majority groups in favor of members of minority or historically disadvantaged groups is what it states. And you can read on. There's a whole thing on that. Um, here's one, too. I'm sorry for pushing back so much with the Trump thing, but I'm sure people really wouldn't care. Not many people listen to me anyway. Anyway, National Review writes, The race war, no one can win. I've said this before, too. I did a whole fucking story about this. Even this age of runaway emotions, there is still some people who want to know the facts. Anyway, it says, Nowhere are facts more important or more lacking than what has been apparently called the war on cops. The title of this uh, devastating new of uh, a devastating new book by Heather McDonald. Few, if any, of the most fashionable notions about the police, minorities, and the criminal justice system can withstand an examination of hard facts. Um, yet, I'm sorry, I'm not really reading that well. Yet, those fashionable notions continue to dominate discussions in the media in politics, and in the academic world, pretty much, academia. But 
Miss McDonald's book of documented facts demolishes many fashionable notions. So her book, she put out a book, this uh, Mac McDonald, she put out this book that basically kind of def- the, um, takes the steam out of, oh, well, black Americans are the ones being um, being uh, pinpointed and shot and killed by these these racist cops. She kind of deflates that whole thing. Let me get to the the main point. Considering one of the big talking points of politicians and others who claim that the harsher penalties for people selling crack cocaine, um, selling crack cocaine than for people selling powder cocaine show racism since crack cocaine is more likely to be used by blacks. The fact, the cold fact, however, is that black political and uh, community leaders Back in the 1980s, spearheaded the drive for more severe legal penalties, penal, uh, you know, penalties against those who uh, sold crack cocaine. So it was actually the fact is it's the black pol- political figures who actually pushed for this harsher, harsher penalty on, you know, the crack cocaine is what it said. Black uh, Congressman Charlie Rangel of Harlem was just one of those black leaders who argued argued that these more severe penalties uh, came forth. So, you know, here we are blaming the white person, but it's actually a black politician who uh, enforced these laws or actually made them so stringent. There's some really interesting points in this one that I'm trying to look for the ones that I want... um, wanted to read anyway her book was called are cops racist that's the book by heather mcdonald so you want to check that out i heard it's really good it says in her book many facts reported in the war on cops spoil many notions that all too many people choose to believe one of the most popular arguments used in many different contexts let me just open up my in context, um, is to show that blacks have been disproportionately represented among people stopped by police, arrested, or in prison, as well as disproportionately represented among people turned down for mortgage loans or for other benefits. This might be the part. Although many people regard these uh, dis apparent impact statistics as ep- evidence or virtually proof of racial discrimination. Suppose that I should tell you that the black basketball players are penalized by the NBA reference out of proportion to the 13% that blacks are in American population. Um, American population. I always question that too because the population of U.S. black Americans is 13%, which I think that is incorrect. Anyway, it goes on to say that black basketball players are several times more numerous than 13% of all NBA players. Basically saying that, oh, well, they only make up a small percentage of black Americans who play on basketball teams, but yet they make up the largest percentage of players on any given team. Anyway, it says this is especially so among the star players who are likely to be on the floor rather than sitting on the bench. And players on the floor, most are the ones most likely to be penalized. A related story was, does race play a role when uh, political kill civilians? uh, Police kill, kill civilians, I apologize. Anyway, it goes on to say, the difference between the percentage of blacks in the general population and the percentage of blacks in the particular Activities being discard, discussed is the key to fraudulent use of desperate impact statistics in many other contexts. Hillary Clinton, for example, described a disgraceful uh, disgrace of criminal justice system that incarcerates so many African Americans proportionally. Um, it says, yeah, proportionally than um, whites. So may, mainly she was stating that, oh, they basically arrest or shoot or kill more blacks than whites. And this is not true. 
The most reliable crime statistics are statistics on murders, 52% of which were committed by blacks over a period from 1976 to 2005. If blacks are convicted of far more than 13% of all murders, does that mean that racism is... Racism in the courts must be the reason. Well, not necessarily. Um, on the ben- uh, benefits side, there was an instant condemnation of mortgage lenders when statistics showed that blacks being turned down for prime mortgage loans in 2000 were at twice the rate that uh, of that of whites turned down. So that's what it said. But then they don't go into the actual facts, which is does it says seldom if ever did the media report though that whites were turned down at nearly twice the rate of as that of asian americans were turned down so basically they're saying well blacks get turned down more than whites but they leave out of this equation that whites actually get turned down for home mortgage loans more so, twice as much, whites do get turned down twice as much as Asians. But you don't hear that. The news won't report that because there's no story in there of how to discriminate against whites. So, um, let's see. It goes on to say, yeah, about the Asians. Or that Asian Americans average... Okay, maybe i got to go back to uh, a little further. Seldom, if ever, did the media report that whites turned down at or turned down nearly twice the rate of Asian Americans were turned down. So they don't report this fact. That Let me rephrase this in a way I can understand it. Even though they say blacks are turned down more so than whites for mortgage loans, they don't say that whites are turned down much more than Asians by two to one. Or that Asian Americans' average credit scores were higher than the average credit scores of whites, which are higher than the average credit scores of blacks. So if you really want to make an analysis, you can't make it on whites. You would have to make it on Asians, which they will not do because if they did that, they would not have a story because you'd have minority on minority. Such facts would have spoiled the privilege Preconceptions, many facts reported in the war on cops boil many notions that all, all too many people choose to believe. We need to stop this nonsense, it says, before there is a race war. Wow, I did a podcast on that. I said about a race war. I said there would be a race war or civil war, and I get laughed, literally laughed by people when I mention this to them. Yet, this story from National... Review says exactly what I had did a whole podcast on before there is a race war that no one can win. So, okay, and that's what it was titled too: the race war no one can win. I said this. I did a fucking podcast on this and I get laughed at like I have no fucking clue what I'm talking about. Um, so there you go. National Review actually said exactly what I was trying to say. I don't really have a grasp on how to, um, you know, put forth what I need to say in a, in a way that makes sense to people. It doesn't even make sense to me. Um, so anyway, and, and that that actually did it. Read it yourself, please do. I have a story from Marty um, Menko or whatever. Are whites getting shortchanged with a question mark? We are constantly are um, urged to make greater efforts to improve a lot of women in African Americans, yet it seems fairer at this point in American history to make greater efforts to improve a lot of white males. So again, this is something I have to support my point, and this guy is doing it for me. Um, from his webpage, Marty, um, it's spelled his last name because I'm not pronouncing it right. I'm looking for his name now. Um, N E M K O. So that's the last dot com. I can hear you laughing. After all, most CEOs and political leaders are white males, but when you leave that, the top point one percent things look different. So that that percentage, like I said, of the filthy rich that everybody complains about, is only makes up point one percent. 
I have a career and counseled almost 2,000 people, and unless they are stars, my white male clients have a tougher time getting hired more so do, than do women in minorities. This is what this guy is writing on his webpage, this guy Marty. Hey, Marty, we accept the gospel in the widely reported statistics that women earn 77 cents on the dollar. Fact is, according to research by Dr. Warren Farrell, when all variables are controlled, for example, annual hours worked, experience, work hazard, commute disease, and performance evaluations for the same work, women earn more than men. I've said this before, too. I've done so many fucking podcasts, and I get laughed so many times. I need to show my one friend at work, my friend John, that he needs to see this, too. Yet white males continue to see more and more efforts to help everyone except the white male. Employers often practice reverse discrimination. That's why I had to look that up. If only because they fear the EEOC will count noses. And when they're downsizing, which we have happened at my job, when there is a downsizing, employers resist. Here we go. Employers resist firing women and minorities, knowing that many of them would file for wrongful for wrongful wrongful termination. I got to send this to my friend Todd right now, actually. So I do this. So he needs to see this himself. Because my friend Todd, he's held management positions and now he's going to be out of a job. And this is exactly the situation he's in. I try to explain this to him, but he doesn't seem to want to listen. So maybe her see it on his webpage. He will at least read it. Um, if minorities or women receive less pay or so-called underrepresented in a particular profession, for example, in the boardrooms, women groups insist um, in mainly because of sexism that white males are essentially erected um, a glass ceiling through which they allow pitiful few women to uh, seep. Privately, however, most of the female clients I've worked with, with this person, which is about 1,400, most of these women are well-educated in middle cla- in, um, and middle class, he says, and are unwilling to put in a long in long hours to, um, it to put in the long hours it takes to go to the top. I want to moderate work life with plenty of time for spouse, children, and or um, vocations. Many more of my male clients are willing to work the long hours, though it takes to rise to the top. So the difference is, women don't want to put in the time. They they're more interested in their social life, is what it's kind of saying in my way. Of putting it, but it's basically saying the same thing. But then they're bitching, complaining. Well, hey, I'm being held back. You're you're holding yourself back, and they actually have much more advantages because this guy actually says on his webpage, for the, the God's honest truth is that minorities are going to be the last one to get laid off. It's going to be the white male, which I've said in the past, and it just uh, actually says exactly what I think. So I have to kind of def- you know defuse everything this girl was telling me because it was it was she believes what she was saying and I I not knocking her for that but it's definitely a misconception on the truth. Anyway, um, the media gives millions of dollars of free exposure to sexism arguments. For example, unquestionably prom- uh, prob propagating and misleading women earn 77 cents per dollar, which is nonsense, basically. Statistics yet give virtually no exposure to the opposite views. They don't want to. And if a man, uh, men are underrepresented, for example, as they are in college, colleges are now 59% women, 41% men. You, But you barely hear a peep about this in the media. So women are all being attacked and sexually assaulted by men, but yet men make up a smaller percentage than women. So that makes no sense at all. Professional um, baseball, football, and basketball 
are dominated by minorities. This is what this guy is saying, and I've said this before. Um, ever hear of the media decree the unpresentation of white males? So I don't want to read this whole thing. It's actually very interesting. Okay, and it says, most seriously, men die six years younger than women, yet there is no call for more spending on men's health. Where are all these advocates who scream when women are and minorities are, get a short end, um, the short end of the si- uh, of the stick? They still are um, still calling for more medical studies on women, even though the days are long gone when most medical research was done on men. So there's always this double standard on everything. And I said that the male is a dying breed, and nobody seems to believe me. I'm, I'm making up. I shut that story down, so you don't have to re- worry about me reading that any longer. So I think I've actually – I'm not going to read everything I had posted. I did spend literally two hours going through all this stuff and trying to find things to support every um, story that you know kind of deflate what she was saying. So you could probably actually see the rest of these stories on um, on my Facebook page. I'm having actually a little bit of difficult time opening most of these anyhow. So um, I don't know what happened, but you will see those. I actually didn't have a problem with my laptop. And it is actually after an hour and a half. I try to keep my stories within that. It's like 5 o'clock. So the sun's going to be coming up for me. So what I'm going to do right now, folks, I said I'm going to do this for how long now, since the beginning of my show. I will play this segment to you know, kind of clear the air, uh, cut right to the chase, and maybe I'll just look, but I don't think I really am interested in doing any more stories at this point. But I want to do this thing on Donald Trump's Why? I, I, I'm so sick and tired of this whole thing about how she basically, that's all you've heard about on every news source. It's been covered um, to an nauseating, um, what do you call it? Like, it's been just covered way too much, making such a big deal out of ripping off um, Michelle Obama. Even Alan West made a comment that he thought it was just ridiculous the other day. So let me play that now. Rush Limbaugh. Um, Go. He reads some short, brief article on Donald Trump's rights. So here, wife. So here we go now. To whom it may concern. And by the way, there's something very interesting in this statement. You'll hear it when I read it. To whom it may concern. My name is Meredith McIver, and I am an in-house staff writer at the Trump Organization. I am also a longtime friend and admirer of the Trump family. In working with Melania Trump on her recent First Lady speech, we discussed many people who inspired her and messages that she wanted to share with the American people. A person she has always liked is Michelle Obama. Over the phone, she read me some passages from Mrs. Obama's speech as examples of things that she liked. I wrote them down and later included some of the phrasing in the draft that ultimately became the final speech. I did not check Mrs. Obama's speeches. And this was my mistake. And I feel terrible for the chaos I have caused Melania and the Trumps, as well as to Mrs. Obama. No harm was meant. Yesterday, I offered my resignation to Mr. Trump and the Trump family, but they rejected it. Mr. Trump told me that people make innocent mistakes and that we learn and grow from these experiences. I asked to put out this statement because I did not like seeing the way this was distracting from Mr. Trump's historic campaign for president and Melania's beautiful message and presentation. I apologize for the confusion and the hysteria my mistake has caused. Today, more than ever, I am honored to work for such a great family. I personally admire the way Mr. Trump has handled this situation, and I am grateful for his understanding. Sincerely, Meredith McIver. Okay, hey, I'm back. You know what? I'm going to end it pretty much now. Melania Trump, I guess is the way you're saying her name. I know I'm probably still not saying it right. 
But yeah, I wanted to play that. I actually wanted to play it earlier on the show, but it's um, a little over an hour and a half. Um, so, folks, this is Walter from I Walter. I apologize for this abrupt ended of my show, but it's just it is like after five. It's like five thirty. I won't be going to bed until six a.m. So, I hope you enjoy what I talked about. I still gotta you know get this done before the end of the night or early in the morning because it is Friday morning at 5.15 a.m. I should have been in bed hours ago. Um, so, yeah, if you like what I talk about, please let me know. I just needed to kind of, you know, defuse a lot what this girl was telling me um, from just, you know, the other day. Because, I mean, it's nothing against her. And, I hey, I'm, I'm willing to go on with anybody and talk to them. You just got to give me a little bit of time to be able to um, have the, you know, the time or kind of like I was, you know, I did it myself, but I was a little bit blindsided by the whole situation, I feel. So I didn't have a chance to, like, support my points. Um, now that I do or have, it makes uh, a difference. I did post, again, a lot of stuff on my Facebook page. I'm just having a really difficult time opening it up right now, though, too. Um, but I did, I think, cover a bit of it, so I hope that helped at least me out. Um, thanks again. This is Walter, my Walter, and I'm going to be signing off for now. <laughs>